Right on. So um, Ben Fletcher, cover the book pictured here. Yeah, um, you've probably not heard of him, but I'm suggesting to you that he was the most important leader of the IWW's most effective interracial union, which controlled the Philadelphia waterfront for almost a decade due to its militancy and direct action tactics. And that Ben Fletcher, who was one of the leaders of that union, was one of the most important black labor figures in all of US history. Yet very few people, even those who um, really are interested in labor history or, or identify themselves on the so-called left, even know his name. Um, I'm also a believer, not surprisingly, um, that not only is he important historically, but um, that the history um, offers us something to consider um, uh, for our times, right? Very much um, you know, port, uh, part of urgent political projects of, of, of the present. So Ben Fletcher deserves our attention and our awareness and our, our sort of understanding because he led the most powerful interracial multi-ethnic union in the early 20th century. That union was called Local 8. It belonged to the industrial workers of the world, right? Um, in the early 20th century, as I note here, racism and xenophobia were rampant, um, as was economic inequality. You may think that racism and xenophobia and inequality are bad now, but let me suggest to you that actually the early 20th century was probably even more the case, right? Um, therefore, it's very interesting that Ben Fletcher, a young black man from Philadelphia, um, sort of led this powerful union. And so when we think about Fletcher, but also the union that he was a part of, um, we think about these sort of intertwined dynamics of race and class. Um, we also think about these sort of um, potentials and limits of direct action tactics versus bread and butter unionism in, in an interracial and, and later actually predominantly black union. Um, and so hopefully you'll um, appreciate um, what this is all about um, by the end of my presentation. So Ben Fletcher was African-American man, born in Philadelphia in 1890. Philadelphia, by the way, was the third biggest city in the country at that time, and a really mighty industrial city, even though, well, it's still a significant place, but um, you, you, you may sort of take for granted what you know about Philadelphia. Philadelphia was an incredibly important industrial center, as well as a big port city, and it drew people, just like other industrial cities, um, in the Northeast and the Midwest um, from, of course, other countries at that time, mostly Europe, but also from uh, rural regions, especially the American South. Ben Fletcher's parents moved from Virginia and Maryland in sometime in the 1880s, met in Philadelphia, um, and were probably born enslaved. They were both born in the 1850s and the average African-American in the 1850s in Virginia and Maryland was enslaved. Yeah, um, we don't know why they left their home places to move to Philadelphia, although it's reasonable to conclude that they did so to escape the rising racism and violence that was um, pervasive in the South in the 1880s and early 1890s um, in the aftermath of Reconstruction, right? The failure of Reconstruction to achieve equality that had been um, promised at the end of the Civil War, right? And why Philadelphia, Philadelphia actually had the largest black population um, uh, in the United States um, outside of the South in that era in the late 19th and early 20th century and had a long history of black um, population going back to its uh, early 17th century, right? And so Fletcher was born to working class parents in 1890 uh, in Philadelphia. Um, a more famous Philadelphian uh, or black Philadelphian in the 1890s was W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, his first book was actually called The Philadelphia Negro. Um, he went on to become undeniably the most significant black intellectual and activist perhaps in 20th century America. Um, but his first book, The Philadelphia Negro, about basically the neighborhood where Fletcher was born into, right? Um, and the short version of that book is that racism defined the experience of black people, men and women, especially on the job especially on the job that regardless of what skills one might have simply because you were black, you were denied most jobs. Um, and instead employers would regularly hire European immigrants who didn't know English and weren't citizens, right? But instead uh, gave them preferential treatment, if you will, right? Um, people like my parents who are coming actually to the United States in the early 20th century. Um, Philadelphia was also sort of notorious for being a tough town to organize unions. Um, so one labor organizer called it Scab Town, another called it the Graveyard of Unionism. Um, and it was also sort of interesting fun fact, right? The only big American city in that era that was um, dominated by a Republican party machine, right? And so it had a machine politics, um, but actually it was a Republican machine, wouldn't become a democratic stronghold actually until the mid 20th century, right? And so actually a pretty conservative city in terms of its politics particularly nativist, which is to say xenophobic, 
right? Um, it was in this milieu that Ben Fletcher, a young man in his late teens, maybe the age of 20, joined the Industrial Workers of the World, so around the year 1910. Um, he also joined the Socialist Party of America, which at that time was quite common actually for people to do, be involved in both those organizations, one really with an electoral focus, one with a workplace focus, that difference in vision for how to achieve socialism was actually explained a subsequent split between these organizations so that Fletcher and others stuck with the Wobblies, if you will, and would have dropped out of the Socialist Party. Um, why does Fletcher join? Why does Fletcher become a left-wing uh, sort of person and then a left-wing activist? The truth is we don't really know for sure, right? Like um, he was, uh, didn't graduate from high school, right? Um, went into the workforce in his teens. Um, at that time, of course, to be an African-American, you would have had a long list of things that you were upset about, right? In terms of your society, right? And so um, there was no reason to sort of embrace mainstream politics if you were an African-American. <laughs> uh, both main parties had essentially abandoned, right? Um, African-Americans. Um, and so that might be part of it. He might've been walking down the street in his working class neighborhood in South Philadelphia Philadelphia um, and heard a soapbox speaker, right? A soapbox speaker was a person who basically literally stood on a, a wooden box nicknamed the soapbox in order to be taller than the, 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 the crowd on the streets. This is before radio, um, as well as before TV and film and sort of the internet. And so if you wanted to organize, whether you were trying to get people to join your church, um, to donate money, right? Or to sort of join a political or economic organization, you would have literally just gone into the street and started to speak, right? And hopefully people would stop and listen. Right? Um, Fletcher himself became a well-known and, and, and highly respected street speaker right? um, in Philadelphia and in other cities. And so it's actually not inconceivable that that's how he first learned about it. Right? Literally, he might have been walking to the riverfront in order to find a job right? and heard some people talking about the IWW. Right? Like, um, he was already a member before the Dock Worker Union was formed. Right? And so he was already an active member and a leader in Philadelphia and the IWW prior to the union that I'll tell you about in a few minutes. Um, in 1905 in Chicago, I'm speaking to you this morning, uh, this afternoon from Chicago, and in 1905 is when um, the Industrial Workers of the World was founded. This is a revolutionary union. What does that mean? It means that they reject capitalism, right? Um, that they actually aren't simply about trying to get a higher wage or fewer hours of work for their members. They want that, but they want much more than that, right? Like they reject the system period, right? Um, in the early 20th century, I appreciate that you've studied this in your course. Um, this is before government regulation, right? Um, there was literally not a single law in the books that would have told a corporation how to, um, whether it's sort of pollution or whether it's sort of workplace safety or whether it's sort of workplace hours or wages, none of those laws exist, right? Like um, the government does nothing to protect ordinary Americans um, and corporations in fact often um, uh, have government do its bidding, um, in particular dispatching the US Army or the police in cities in order to sort of break strikes and sort of weaken or destroy unions, right? Um, and so in this time, right, um, uh, it's not surprising actually that lots of working class people and, and some non-working class people thought that the system was sort of inherently flawed, could never be reformed and needed to be uh, sort of eliminated, right, in lieu of socialism, right? Like, um, and so the IWW was founded expressly as um, anti-capitalist, but also anti-nationalist, right? Um, hence their name, right? Like, uh, and so someone actually proposed that the union be named the Industrial Workers of America as a rival to the American Federation of Labor, right? And that was rejected by the membership, excuse me, by those at the founding convention, right? Um, because they said, no, actually this is sort of a bigger than the United States of America. Capitalism was global and therefore um, the only um, alternative would be an internationalist vision very interesting, um, not unique. Many socialists also embrace that sort of internationalist vision, um, but many didn't, right? Uh, many really were stuck in a sort of a, a thinking inside of a nation state framework, right? Um, as you probably know from your esteemed professor, members of the IWW are nicknamed Wobblies, affectionately so, um, and still are named as such. Um, now, uh, the IWW was socialist because, well, look at this, great poster from 1911, right? Um, because most people basically work hard to support the few at the top, right? Like uh, that the system was inherently unfair, um, that most people in fact don't benefit from the status quo, um, but that most people need each other, 
right? And so this notion of solidarity, which is so important to the IWW, um, <laughs> is uh, sort of central to this vision and, and their motto, an injury to one is an injury to all, right? Um, is, is such a commonsensical yet powerful slogan. It is adopted by dozens of other unions subsequently in the US, but actually also in many other countries, right? Like um, I might also say a few other things about its rival, the American Federation of Labor, we, um, Mainstream unions, most of them were affiliated with this sort of umbrella organization called the AFL. Um, a, their name, American, right? Like, uh, well, that tells you already. That's actually, of course, the norm. Most people in the US thought of themselves in that way, right? Um, but the IWW was rejecting that notion, right? Um, why was the AFL sort of not good enough to the people who founded the IWW? Well, the AFL chose not to organize most women workers chose not to organize most African-American workers, chose not to organize most immigrant workers, chose not to organize most unskilled workers, which is to say the American Federation of Labor chose not to organize most workers, right? Like, uh, and to Wobblies, this seemed absurd, right? Like, uh, why would you possibly think you could form a powerful labor movement by intentionally excluding the majority of laborers, right? Like, um, in addition to that, right? Um, in addition to that, the FFL's agenda was sort of um, reformist and short-term wages and hours. Now I wanna earn more money and work fewer hours also. So those are fine to sort of have, but that was essentially the sum total, right? Of the AFL vision and the IWW had an entirely different vision, right? Um, and very quickly thousands, then tens of thousands and ultimately hundreds of thousands of, of Americans and immigrants started to join the IWW. Yeah, um, as a result of the power of its vision but also the belief in by its members. Now with that as a sort of IWW shorthand, we can sort of transition to Philadelphia. But when I'm talking about Philadelphia, I'm, I'm actually also talking about every other port city in the United States, but also for that matter, this is the same way port cities operated around the world. Whether you're talking about London, England or Hamburg, Germany or Melbourne, Australia or Shanghai in China or Durban in South Africa, if you wanted to get a job on the, uh, to load and unload ships, right, which is what in the US we call longshore men or longshore workers, you'd go down to the river or down to the port and try to get picked, right? Um, and what if there's hundreds of you, but there's only dozens of jobs? Right um, in the system, which was nicknamed the shape up, the boss wins. Right, um, employers get to pick and choose who they want. Um, hiring bosses would often pe pick people based on sort of being of the same race, the same neighborhood, the same religion. They also might pick you because you gave them a bribe. Right, um, but they everyone understood that the system divided workers because you saw each other as competition. Right, um, and weakened therefore workers. Right, and so the shape up was hated, and it also drove down wages, right? If you got hired for one of these jobs, well, the work on the waterfront was dangerous work. Um, I always say that um, in this era and even today, right? Like even though the work is quite different today, um, it's a dangerous workplace, right? Um, so, uh, you know, in Philadelphia in 1913, you walk onto the waterfront, you might die, right? Like that's not an exaggeration. In fact, people died all the time. Uh, you might not die, but you also might get seriously injured, right? Um, so dangerous work, um, heavy work, Right? It was not uncommon for you to have to lift and load several hundred pound sacks, right? going up and down ladders um, on ships that are of course moving in day and in night, in good weather and in bad, in rain and in snow. Right? Um, and you might work 12 hours, you might work 18 hours, you might work 36 hours. Right? Why? Because the ship must sail on time. Right? Like, uh, and so the pressure of the work is heavy. Right? Um, and then after you do this work for a day or five days, you may not have another job. Right, like you're gonna have to go through the hiring process again in order to get picked, right? Um, this sometimes is called casual labor. I put in quotes because it's not at all casual, but like that's the sort of a term widely used. Now we use this term precarious, um, which is a good term, although it's not a term widely used, um, but it gives us a sense of the sort of the inherent instability of the work. Despite these problems, dock workers actually have some benefits to them, something that you're, um, Dr. Gregory uh, hinted at a little in the introduction, dock workers have collective identity and power um, potentially, right? First of all, they have to work together, right? Literally, you often have to lift things together. You work in gangs. It might be 20 men to a gang, might be five or six gangs to a ship. And so no one loads and unloads a ship by themselves at that time, right? Uh, and so you work together. That generates a collective identity. And you also have an us them mentality, right? Um, no one goes from working on the docks to becoming a ship captain or the owner of a ship corporation, right? Like, uh, and so this notion of mobility that's so um, important in the sort of the ideal of capitalism that um, in America that any poor person can become rich, 
not really, right? <laughs> You're not really gonna see a dock worker become the sort of a ship owner, right? Like, and of course that also fits neatly into the IWW vision, um, the preamble of the IWW constitution, which begins workers and employers share nothing in common, right? Like, um, and so what do we got here? We have class division and for some class consciousness, right? Like, um, and so what we see here um, in Philadelphia is of course a microcosm of what's going on worldwide. Um, if you happen to see me talk in 2019, I, I told this story then, but I tell it all the time because it's such a good one, right? It was actually in, in, in London, the greatest port city in the world in the 18th century, um, that sailors who wanted to raise um, took down the sails of their ship when they arrived in London Harbor on, on the Thames River, right? To take down the sail of your ship is to strike the sail is the nautical term. And that term becomes the de facto word we all use to this day to describe work stoppages in the English language, right? Um, that tells us a lot about the centrality of maritime work, i.e. shipping to um, uh, the economy, to capitalism specifically, as well as really understanding that it was shipping that helped Europe dominate the world for the last 500 years of the second millennium, right? Which is to say from the 15th century into the 20th century, right? Europe dominated. And it, a lot of it had to do with their superior shipping technology that came to result in the conquest, right? Of the Americas, um, large parts of Latin America, Asia, and so on, right? Um, it also, again, tells us why shipping matters so much. So back in Philadelphia, um, where Ben Fletcher and others start to organize the waterfront in the early 19 teens in, the, in, in 1913, um, Dock workers in Philadelphia um, were one third African American, one third Irish and Irish American, and one third immigrants from other European countries, right? Um, think Poland, Italy, and the like, right? Um, very diverse workforce. Generally speaking, the American Federation of Labor didn't do a very good job of organizing that sort of diverse workforce, although they did have a union in this industry, right? Um, including in Seattle for that matter, right? Like um, uh, bosses also sort of reinforced these. Um, sort of divisions among workers by hiring gangs that were all black, all Irish, all Polish, all Italian, and playing these gangs off each other, right? So that you simultaneously hate your coworkers, but also um, work faster, which is only to the benefit of the boss, right? Like, because um, um, you want to prove you're stronger, prove you're better, right? Like, uh, it was in this milieu, in this um, place in the spring of 1913, that um, basically the Philadelphia dock front workforce, about 4,000 men at that time, all male, um, walked off the job um, and went on strike, shut down the, the fifth biggest port in the country, third biggest city, um, and um, basically forced employers to negotiate. Um, it was during this moment, which was common in, in this era, um, to simultaneously strike and form a union, right? Um, this is before there was laws that recognized unions, right? Um, your boss recognized your union if you had the power to force them to recognize your union, right? Not because they went through some vote, right? The way that the National Labor Relations Board organizes it nowadays, right? Like, uh, and so it was in this time that the IWW, Ben Fletcher, already a leader in the IWW in the city of Philadelphia, organizes, right? Um, local eight. Um, and after two weeks, this strike is victorious, right? Um, they win wages, but they also weigh, win basically in union recognition. Once they do so, they institute changes. So let me repeat that. Um, they institute changes, right? Um, the country is racist, right? Um, the waterfront is racist. However, this union says we are going to be anti-racist. Now they didn't use that term because that term wasn't used really in the early 20th century in the same way we use it, um, but they immediately integrated the work gangs, right? Um, so rather than having a black gang and a Polish gang, now black and Polish and Irish workers work in the same groups. They mandate that their leadership ranks be racially integrated and mixed, meaning that certain jobs were reserved, certain posts for blacks, certain posts for whites. Their social events were also sort of integrated by all accounts. In other words, as I say, they integrated the, the waterfront and their union um, 51 years before the Civil Rights Act of 1964 mandated that American institutions did that, right? Um, they did it um, because they wanted to and believed it was necessary, despite what was the norm in their workplace, as well as in their city and our country, right? Um, they also were able to get rid of the shape up. Um, they uh, didn't like the shape up. Dock workers always hated the shape up. Subsequently, um, it just disappeared, right? Like uh, now employers would have to call up the union hall in order to request workers be dispatched to this, uh, to different peers um, uh, the next day, for example. 
Like many unions, Local 8 issued buttons to members who had paid their dues, their um, new membership or their monthly dues. Um, enough people work on the waterfront that you don't always know who your coworkers are, right? Like um, these buttons still exist. If you are sort of a rich left-wing collector, you can buy these for hundreds of dollars online. Um, or you can just do like me and take a screenshot, right? Like uh, of uh, uh, one of these um, or several of these buttons. Um, these were also useful because when you get hired, well, just always remember the boss hates you, right? Um, the boss hates the union, I should say, right? Like um, the boss is therefore gonna try to hire workers who are not in the union. Right. Um, and so it's up to the members to the C to make sure everybody who's working is not is, is, is in the union and, and fully paid up. And if not, you go to the boss, your hiring boss and say, you need to knock off these workers or else we're going to walk. Right. Um, and although that may seem dramatic, um, there are documented cases where basically um, halfway through a shift, um, the members of the, the, the gang would basically just um, pull up the slings, um, cut the ropes and walk off the ship mid, 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 mid shift in order to sort of basically demonstrate collective power in what was called direct action or a quick strike. Um, they also started to institute holidays, right? Um, they would have an annual birthday event, right? And so um, this week is actually the beginning, uh, the anniversary of when their strike began, May 14th, 1913, right? Like, uh, so tomorrow, I think. Um, but uh, they, um, in subsequent years, they would basically, um, basically take the day off, right? Um, on their first anniversary, when they told their employers they were gonna do this, the bosses said, don't come back to work <laughs> if you're not going to come back, if you're not working in the morning. Um, by the evening, according to accounts, the employers were actually asking them to sort of work the night shift, right, to sort of catch up on the work because, in fact, most workers apparently went to um, the celebration of their union. These are the sorts of examples of tactics that the IWW used. This is not unique to Philadelphia. I'm describing Philadelphia, but these tactics were not developed there originally or um, by alone. Um, the IWW also never signed contracts. Why? Because um, workers' greatest power was to stop work, which is to say to strike. Um, and if uh, most union contracts, including mine and the American Federation of Teachers, my local, is a no strike clause, right? For the duration of the contract, you can't strike, right? Um, the Wobblies said, well, that was a bad idea, right? Um, we want to always have this potential power, right? It also means that the boss could always potentially cream you and <laughs> wipe you out, right? Like, uh, and so it goes both ways, right? Workers maintain the power to strike, but they also don't have any guarantee that the union is going to be able to demand, defend the, the, the prerogatives that they've won if the employer suddenly changes, right? Like, um, and so that results in a sort of a higher level of, 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 of on-job activism that's required, not just among the elected leaders like Fletcher, but among the members. Um, I also want to highlight just quickly that um, this is a global union. The Industrial Workers of the World is not just the name, it's actually uh, a reality. Each union operated somewhat independently in each country, but very quickly after the formation of the IWW in 1905, um, the IWW spread to Mexico and Canada, um, spread to the Caribbean, spread to um, Argentina, Chile, other parts of South America, spread to Australia and New Zealand, spread to Ireland, the UK, and the continent of Europe, spread to Southern Africa, right? Um, uh, generally, it would be sailors who would have brought the ideas, the literature, and the passion um, to other port cities, although it's not always sailors, it might just be migrants. Um, but uh, the photograph on the right, which I really love, is from uh, New Zealand, right? Um, in Philadelphia, I'm, talk going, I'm talking about sort of an anti-racist union. The IWW was not only anti-racist in the United States. In New Zealand, the indigenous population known as Maori, right, um, were working class people, right? They generally were the majority of people in the sheep industry, in the wool industry, and in the mining industry, right? Um, the IWW had a column in its newspaper that was uh, translated into Maori, right, so that they might be able to appeal to Maori workers, right? Like, this in a time when the average white resident of New Zealand or Australia was racist, right? Um, um, as was the case in South Africa, where the IWW was the first white union to organize blacks, African workers, right? Like, and so they weren't always successful, right? Uh, by any means, um, but they actually were trying to sort of implement their vision um, everywhere they operated pretty much. Now back in Philadelphia, um, you know, where Ben Fletcher was a sort of a leader, as I mentioned, um, 
Fletcher is widely known in the IWW at the national level, and, and he's very respected for his speaking and organizing ability to organize black workers, but not only black workers. And so he's often sort of dispatched to go to Boston, go to Providence, Rhode Island, where there happens to be a lot of black um, uh, people from the Black Atlantic, Portuguese colonists, basically, um, Cape Verdeans and others who um, are waterfront workers. He's often sent to Baltimore where there's an African-American um, waterfront workforce, et cetera, right? And so Fletcher becomes a, not just an important organizer in Philadelphia, but also up and down the Atlantic coast. Um, it's in Norfolk, Virginia, which is the biggest port in Virginia in early 1917 that he's sent to organize. Um, and he experiences a lot of heckling from, according to later accounts, from white people in the uh, in meat crowd, right? Um, and um, it was in this moment, according, uh, these are documents that I cover in my book um, about Ben Fletcher, right? Um, that he is sort of asked some questions about how does he feel about interracial sex and interracial marriage, in which case he says something to the effect of, well, I'm the blackest guy here, right? Um, he was a very dark skinned black man, right? Uh, implying basically that why are white people talking to me about sort of interracial sex? Everybody knows that white men want to sleep with black women. And all you have to do is look around at all the fair skinned black people <laughs> to know that white people actually have no problem with interracial sex, right? Um, what they have is of course is problems with black men having sex with white women specifically specifically, right? Like, um, but that sort of conversation is dangerous, right? Um, dozens of black men were lynched every year in the United States in the 19 teens. And so friends of his smuggled him out of Norfolk that night on a ship. And he ended up in Boston, right? Um, because it was too, uh, too hot to be in Norfolk any longer. It was in Boston that he was first surveyed by the federal government. Um, uh, the United States had declared war in 19, spring of 1917. Um, very quickly, the US Congress will give, uh, pass the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act to basically criminalize dissent, which is to say it becomes illegal to speak against the US involvement in World War I or to write against the US involvement in World War I or to oppose the draft. It becomes a federal crime. And in fact, um, the Bureau of Investigation, later known as the Federal Bureau of Investigation's first target really during World War I is the IWW. Hundreds and hundreds of lobby leaders are arrested and indicted on federal charges of espionage and or sedition. And Ben Fletcher was one of six Philadelphians who was part of that. Um, and then sent to Chicago for a mass trial in 1918, um, where they were put on trial, approximately 100 of them, for so-called espionage and sedition, right? I mean, it's during this time that Fletcher's humor becomes well known to people beyond his friend circle, right? During the trial, right? He turns to his friend, Big Bill Haywood and says, if it wasn't for me, there'd be no color at all in this trial since he was the only African-American among the defendants. Um, when the uh, um, trial ends and the jury comes back in under an hour telling basically them that all hundred or so are guilty on all counts, um, uh, Fletcher turns again to Haywood and says, the judge doesn't use very good grammar today. And Haywood says, how's that been? And Fletcher says, it's because our sentences are much too long. In fact, Fletcher was sentenced to 10 years in federal prison and fined $30,000. I should note that there was not a shred of evidence introduced against Ben Fletcher specifically in the trial. In fact, many of the people who were brought on trial were simply being charged all together because the publications of the IWW, many of which are on the United UW website, thanks to uh, Jim Gregory's work um, to document the IWW and its literature, right? Like uh, that they're just all sort of found guilty for having radical views, right? And so Fletcher and um, dozens of others go from Cook County Jail, the notorious Cook County Jail, where the Haymarket anarchists had later had earlier been found guilty of um, the Haymarket bombing, right? Like uh, that they're sent to on a special train to Leavenworth, Kansas in Eastern Kansas where they began their long sentences. Um, it was while in Leavenworth um, that Fletcher becomes well a political prisoner, right? Like um, probably the second most important political black political prisoner of this era. It won't be for a few more years that Marcus Garvey goes to federal prison but we'll put Garvey at sort of a more significant um, black person in federal prison for his ideas, right? Um, but Fletcher arguably is uh, the second most significant black man in that era um, who suffers from federal persecution. I actually often compare Fred Hampton to Ben Fletcher um, and we could talk about that in the discussion if someone wishes. Um, you know, so Fletcher, um, I don't want, 
I mean, I think he was modest. He doesn't talk a lot about himself. He doesn't write a lot about himself, right? Um, that's unfortunate for those of us who care about him, right? Like, and so it's sometimes challenging to know what he thinks. Um, in other words, what does he think about being in prison, right? Like, and what do you think about being in Leavenworth? Um, we know that hundreds of Wobblies, communists, anarchists, pacifists, religious objectors, were in Leavenworth together. So you could only imagine what this place was like. It wasn't just common criminals, right, like who were in Leavenworth, but in fact, a great many of them were like Fletcher, radicals, right, um, who had been thrown into prison together, right, and who basically talked and hung out and read together, right. Um, one of Fletcher's comrades was a man named Ricardo Flores Magón, a famous Mexican revolutionary who was also an anarchist and was friends with many Wobblies. Magón did write about his time in Leavenworth, and so we might imagine Magón's words speak for Fletcher, um, describing living in Leavenworth he was caught by the formidable mechanism of a monstrous machine and my flesh may get ripped open and my bones crushed and my moans fill the space and make the very infinite shudder, but the machine will not stop grinding and grinding and grinding. We do know some of what Fletcher thought because the federal government, the agents at, at the federal prison basically read all the letters that came in and out of the prison and, 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 and sort of then transcribed them. And so for historians like us, um, those are sort of good fortune, even though the, the, the cause was so unfortunate, right? Um, and many of these documents are again in my book. The majority of my book is actually original documents with me providing very brief introductions, right? Um, so that you can be, uh, interpret the sources for yourself, right? Um, but in one letter that Fletcher wrote to um, a friend of his who was a socialist who lived in Milwaukee, um, among other things he wrote, he said, we are living in momentous times, New Year's Eve, 1920. None of us are gifted with the power of clairvoyancy as to be able to foretell the day or the hour. Therefore, the first and most important duty is for all of us to prepare for the final chapter in the life of capitalism, right? And so even though Fletcher is in prison at that time for several years, his politics have not changed, right? Um, he continues to sort of believe as he had um, beforehand. He will get out of prison a few years later, um, as will most wobbly as his sentence will be commuted, right? Uh, in 1933, FDR will pardon them, but it, uh, he'll hang that over his head. If you commit another crime, when your sentence has been commuted, you might go back to prison and have to finish out your term, right? So he served the better part of three years out of a four year run, uh, although he's sentenced to 10. Um, the union had been weakened by the arrests of a lot of its leaders. Racism is actually rising after World War I, as is xenophobia. Um, there's a challenge on the left from the emergent Communist Party. Um, the AFL union can't wait to get rid of the IWW. The city and the federal government still hate the IWW. Um, employers can't wait to get rid of Local H. All these forces together are too much for Local 8 to stand. And in late 1922, basically Local 8 is locked out, meaning essentially an employer strike, right? Um, and then um, with the support of the federal and local governments and the union is um, just wiped out. Um, the next year, Ben Fletcher is still wobbly. He's still organizing, right? Um, the Messenger, a famous black socialist magazine out of Harlem calls Fletcher the most prominent Negro leader in America. Um, but nevertheless, um, really that 10 year run from 1913 through 22 is the most important one for local eight. Um, a few years of efforts in Philadelphia to try to um, bring the local eight back fail. Uh, a new union is uh, the AFL is able to organize the Philadelphia waterfront. They allow the shape up and segregated gangs to return. Um, uh, but nevertheless, the union um, uh, sort of exists. Um, this amazing poster on the left is actually sort of a sort of an example of IWW anti-racism in the 1920s, right? Um, that's sort of tantalizing. Fletcher, to conclude, will move to New York City around 1930. Um, he will continue to be documented as being a dynamic speaker, um, but in the mid thirties, when he's in his mid forties, he will um, have a major stroke and he'll have a series of other health problems. Um, if, for the rest of his life, he'll die at the age of 59 um, in Brooklyn where he had lived his last 18 years or so. And he's buried in an unmarked grave in Brooklyn. Although I'm part of a group of people who are trying to change that, right? Um, to conclude, well, you know, Ben Fletcher is sort of a, a, a sort of a fabulous figure to think about. Um, he very much believed to his dying days, not only in the power of the working class to achieve socialism, but that it would be the IWW that would be the ones that led them there, right? Um, that may seem out of step, given the fact that the communists had clearly risen um, and other unions and organizations had supplanted 
um, the dominance on the left of the IWW, but nevertheless, Fletcher very much remained committed to the sort of IWW vision. Um, he wasn't a blind optimist. Um, you don't have to tell a black left-wing person to sort of um, be a bit skeptical about what the future holds, right? Like, um, but nevertheless, um, he remained committed to his ideas despite massive repression and despite um, sort of well the failures, right? Um, the failure to achieve what they had hoped, right? Um, but nevertheless, I hope you agree with me that he is well worth knowing. And I thank everyone for your attention um, and especially to um, the people in the class who are sort of here. It'd be um, awesome to sort of uh, talk with you for the next few minutes. Peter, thank you so much. You're such a dynamic speaker. I've always known that about you in person, but it's great that you can convey it also um, in this uh, flat, two-dimensional, crazy format we work in. Um, so I think there are going to be questions. Um, and Andrew Hedden is going to help moderate this. Um, Maybe I'll just going to start off with the one that kind of lurks for me, and you do talk about this. Um, but, you know, this is a very exceptional story, right? A very exceptional man and a very exceptional local. Although you point out that the IWW was um, trying in many other locations outside the country and inside uh, to achieve transracial unionism. Um, could you like, could you push a little bit, explain a little more how we should think about this? I mean, or also with so many Irish workers on the waterfront, how did Fletcher and the black workers overcome that kind of racial tension uh, to solidify the union in, in such a remarkable way for 10 years? Well, I'm happy to, those are big questions. I'll try to be brief. Um, so, I mean, African-Americans are the largest population in the United States who are not people of European descent, right? Like, I mean, now actually that next people have surpassed and there's a lot more Asian Americans around, right? But at that time, we think about African-Americans as really being the key. Um, most black people are still farm workers, right? Like uh, most black people are not yet in the industrial economy. Right. Um, the IWW does try to organize black workers in other places, most famously in, um, in the woods in Louisiana and in Texas, right, in what was called the Brotherhood of Timber Workers. Um, but there are only two examples of really big success, you might say, among black um, workers. So i.e. the Wobblies talk a good game on organizing black workers, but there's the great majority of black workers are simply not in unions, right? Like, uh, now, Booker T. Washington at that time is telling black workers to break strikes, right? Um, because everybody knows that unions are racist and that's generally true, right? It's not true for the IWW, right? Um, but it's, it is true for um, most unions, right? Like, and so we're mindful of that. I do like to sort of widen the lens a bit and, and say that, well, the IWW also organized Mexicans, Mexican-Americans, um, Chinese and Japanese farm workers, I mean, uh, in the United States, the first union that was trying to organize um, other hated non-white groups, right, um, was the IWW. And so I do think it's worth noting, I, I, I said first, but that's incorrect. Of course, there were unions in the past. The most well-known, of course, is the Knights of Labor that also sometimes organized um, workers of color and women, right? Like, um, but the IWW tries to organize, right? But, you know, maybe it takes a Fletcher or someone like Fletcher to be able to sort of speak literally to African-Americans, right? Um, I think the issue of Irish black is a very important one. It's really an urban American story. I'm talking to you from Chicago and let me tell you about black or Irish relations in Chicago, right? Um, uh, there's a lot of examples of Irish um, sort of gangs basically killing um, black people, right? Um, in Philadelphia too, there's notorious black Irish tensions. So how does that work? Right, so the answer is, as usual, we don't have a complete answer, right? Like, um, I can tell you that there were Irish and Irish American Wobblies who were leaders in the IWW and leaders in Philadelphia specifically. And so every group you might say had some of their own in the leadership ranks and the IWW was very conscious about um, the sort of making sure that different groups had representation. So for example, in 1913, during their initial strike 
every ethnic group had someone on strike committee, right? Like, and as you know, as well as maybe some others, that was the case in Lawrence, Massachusetts in 1912 during the famous Bread and Roses strike in Lawrence, which had incredibly had dozens of ethnic groups on strike. And the Wobblies basically made sure that everybody had some of their own people in, the, in essentially the decision-making body, right? Um, because there's reason for people to mistrust other people. Right, unfortunately, right? Like, and so some of it is actually doing that sort of intentional policies, right? To make sure that people feel safe, you might say, right? Because why should I trust these guys when I know in fact that there's problems off the waterfront, right? Like, uh, um, then I say finally that sometimes success breeds success, right? Like, okay, this worked, right? Let's try and do this a bit longer. Okay, it continues to work, right? Now, this is me somewhat imagining because unfortunately we don't have rich internal records of this union. We know what they did, but we don't know what they thought, right? Sometimes we know what people thought, but often we don't know what people thought. And so I'm left with trying to make this, um, make an analyze, right, based on actions, which is not unreasonable, um, even if it's incomplete, right? Um, but I think those are the important questions for us to ask, right? Um, and obviously there's 10 other ways we could follow up that, right? Um, but I'll, I'll shut up for a minute. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, how do you think we should proceed here? Um, well, there's some questions coming in through the chat, which I think we can get to. And um, and then uh, maybe we can, and if people have questions, that, um, I prefer questions through the chat, um, but because we can group questions together. But um, if you do have a comment or something, maybe after we take some questions from the chat, um, we can call on some people. And if you'd like to make a comment or a spoken question, um, you can use the uh, reaction um, option in the Zoom in the Zoom program um, to show a, a raised hand, and we can call on you. But I think we should do um, Jim. If if you agree, I think we could do some questions um, from the chat first. Sure, that works for you. Ready okay. You um, so uh, Peter, um, a number of questions that have come in so far have been about what distinguished the uh, IWW from other factions and tendencies. And um, some, of the, some of those, if you could elaborate, um, were communists and communism. How did they differ from the IWW? Um, industrial unionism and trade unionism, what separated industrial unionism from trade unionism? And then um, how did the IWW's international solidarity uh, differ from Marxist-Leninists or the um, Black Panther um, takes on international solidarity? So those are some questions that came in through the chat. Um, I don't know if you'd like to um, to field field that kind of question. Well, it's my pleasure to try. Um, so maybe the easiest one is the trade union versus industrial union one, right? And so trade unions generally were people who are part of the same skill or craft, right? And so I say, I use the construction trades, like the plumbers are in one union, the electricians are in another, the bricklayers are in a third. Etc. Right? Like you could also have a different model, an industrial union model, where all people who work in the construction industry are in the same union, right? Like, uh, and so those are different models, right? Like they both still exist, actually. It's not just historically, but even now, right, in the US and some other countries, right? The IWW was an industrial union model that was very much clearly sort of built off of the Knights of Labor that had sort of pioneered a lot of these ideas. And the most well known, maybe, industrial union that's part of the AFL and then the AFL-CIO is the United Mine Workers of America, you know, the UMW, um, which is a industrial style union, even though it's in a, the AFL, which generally had craft unions, right? Like um, the, the IWW basically and others who believe similarly said it's stupid to sort of have 20 different unions or 20 different sort of divisions within the same workplace so that you might have the plumbers on strike, but the electricians have to cross the picket line because um, they're on a different contract. Right, like uh, um, when they have the same boss, right, like um, and maybe the same interests, right, like uh, but also that because employers were so strong, you know, think about Amazon, right, and Boeing just for Seattleites, right, like how does, you know, who's stronger if we had twenty unions versus one bag, bag big employer, or what if we had one union versus one big employer, right? And so the argument is the logic is is that industrial unionism is simply a more effective way to sort of get the employer to agree to whatever you may want, right? Like, um, uh, you know, and that's even just for the material gains issue, forgetting about communism or socialism or anything like that, right? Um, I think for the other questions that 
were raised. So let's keep in mind, they're very important questions. Um, communism doesn't exist yet, right? As we understand it, right? The communism will be sort of be born out of the successful um, Soviet revolution in Russia, right? That sort of birthed the Soviet Union, but also then this sort of international communist movement, right? Like the other big traditions on the left are social democracy, or democratic socialism, as it's now called. Um, but most European nations had democratic socialist parties. Um, and the Socialist Party of America was sort of like that, although very small, right? And then um, anarchism, right? Um, and the Wobblies are more anarchistic or anarchist-ish, right? Very suspicious of state power, very suspicious of electoral politics. There's no way that the elites are ever gonna let you vote them out of power. Right, like, uh, um, and basically the state is captured by the elite, right? The courts, the police, etc. So don't waste your time, right? Like, uh, um, so a party approach, illogical in this view, right? Um, and instead, a economic approach. Where are people powerful on the job? Because what you do is you stop work, and so hypothetically, um, socialism will come through a great general strike which you might call a revolution, right? Um, uh, when there's enough workers who are committed to that idea, they just basically down tools and the next day is ours, right? Like, well, that's never happened. Um, uh, but like, that's sort of the vision, right? Like, um, like with many ideologies, it's often easier to criticize what you hate than to sort of uh, imagine what you want, right? Like is what I say, right? Like, um, and so, you know, after World War I, what happens to sort of the last third of your question, the Soviet Union creates a communist international um, based in Moscow, trying to sort of get um, lefties around the world to basically affiliate. Yeah. Um, and many do, right? Um, because they had achieved what no other group of people had, right? They had achieved a socialist society. Of course, a war broke out immediately because anti socialists were, you know, wanted a hold, right? Um, but um, there were many left wing individuals and organizations and unions, the IWW being one example, where they didn't want to affiliate. They were somewhat suspicious of the communist Bolshevik model um, for a variety of reasons, but in particular, the sort of that they saw this sort of party, one party statist approach is more authoritarian, right? Um, this is very much where the IWW's anarchist tradition sort of leans in, right? Um, of course, really the first group of people then and, and, and Trotsky went after in the early 1920s was the anarchist left um, in the Soviet Union, right? Um, and so um, the, the communists wanted to get the IWW in the US as the largest, most powerful left-wing organization arguably in the country, right? Um, the IWW sends people to Moscow for international conferences and the like, um, but ultimately um, decides that they don't like that model um, stay separate, um, that's fine. But of course, as we know in the US, but also in some other countries, the communists actually actively work to undermine uh, left opposition um, in order to basically take control of what was the left. Um, that worked actually in the US and many other countries, um, but people like Ben Fletcher hated the communists, right? Um, because they saw them as disruptors, right? Who basically, um, actively work to undermine the IWW, specifically in Philadelphia. Um, it's actually a sort of long, complicated story and my answer is already long. Um, but um, I'm not saying to sort of be anti-communist per se, I'm saying that Fletcher and the IWW and the, the communists became rivals, but we know what happened. The IWW diminished in power and numbers and the communists became without a doubt the dominant force on the left in the US and the world for the next 60 years, right? Like, um, and so um, with the fall of the Soviet Union, sometimes it's a little easier to sort of have some perspective, right? Um, obviously what Stalin did, killing millions of his own people, lack of freedom, right? Um, the wobbly critique, could there's some truth in my opinion to the wobbly critique of the Soviet model, right? Um, but um, that sort of maybe lays out a bit more detail about these competing ideological traditions, right? Um, uh, as I sort of see, I'm trying to explain what I see Fletcher and the IWW believe, right? Thanks, Peter. Um, uh, we have another kind of set of questions um, that I think maybe we can address next. Um, and that has to do with Fletcher's legacy for today. Um, the specifics of some of the questions that were asked include um, possibilities for um, fast food unions or organizing um, at McDonald's and, and um, 
places like that for a $15 minimum wage. Um, the appeal of the, union, the, the wobbly union model in the wake of the Janus decision, when um, dues are, are optional in unions and, and, um, and then the other question is, uh, has, ties, has, comes from the, um, the experience of the, the union drive at Amazon in Georgia, um, where a lot of the workers there were, were bringing the politics of the Black Lives Matter movement to the workplace. Uh, and the question there is, um, uh, what, can, what can Ben Fletcher and his legacy teach us today about racial justice, social movements, and uh, the role of union organizing? So do you mind um, uh, thinking a little bit about or sharing a little bit your thoughts about Fletcher's legacy for today? Well, it's my pleasure to try. Um, so this isn't specifically about um, Fletcher and the Philadelphia waterfront per se, but the IWW. The IWW often organized workers that the AFL refused to, that were considered unorganizable because of the nature of the work they did. So what's fast food workers? A lot of part-timers, a lot of young people, uh, a lot of people who cycle in and out of the work, right? The AFL basically said, it's not even worth trying with these folks, right? Like, um, they're basically seeding the terrain, right? Like uh, the IWW, as maybe some of the people in this group know, in fact, have tried to organize somewhat successfully fast food workers down in Portland, Oregon, right? Um, the Burgerville chain, which has had some successful wobbly organizing in recent years, right? Um, you know, and so one aspect of what's, what's the IWW they still try to do, right? Well, the IWW has an incarcerated workers committee, right? And so they actually try to organize inside prisons. They try to organize groups that supposedly just can't be organized, right? Um, which another way to think about it is that the people who most need organization, right? Like the people who could most benefit from greater power, right? Like, um, you know, um, I think another sort of set of questions that Andrew sort of was ad um, addressed of me is, how do you basically um, organize workers when you don't have a union, right? Um, and the answer is that workers, we organize ourselves all the time, uh, like without having a formal union, right? My students occasionally sort of basically force me to do things I don't want, even though they're unorganized officially, right? I can sort of sense the mood and change what I might require based on essentially um, the ability of them to exert some um, pressure in informal ways, right? Um, but another way to think about this is that in any social movement, not just labor, right, is that a small group of workers who are well organized can actually push the middle, the, the great mass who basically are either apathetic or too tired or not sure what to do or afraid, right? Like, um, and so a small group of people, a minority of workers in a workplace can in fact maybe earn higher wages, change conditions in the workplace, et cetera. And so uh, even if you don't have a formal union contract, a small but well-organized group of workers can in fact exert power, right? That happens and I think we all probably sort of have witnessed that or experienced that, right? In workplaces of various sorts, right? Like, um, and so, you know, because these are conversations that people are having. It's like, how do we basically organize when it's really hard to organize a union? Um, the Amazon case that we're, um, I'll talk about next is an example of, how basically the, the system is set up such that the employer has so much more power, right? Um, to sort of intimidate workers to vote against what might be their interests. Um, and so, you know, the example uh, of the Amazon case, right? Is interesting for many of us, um, partially because it was a predominantly black workforce, partially because it was in the South, which is the lowest union density, the lowest union membership in the country and a very conservative state politically, right? Like, well, like I say, well, you know, if, if Fletcher and Local A could pull off what they did, which in my opinion was deeply impressive for a decade run, right? When they were fighting the shipping corporations, the federal government, the city, right? Like um, the communists, right? The AFL, right? Like, well, it's actually possible, right? Like, and, and I think actually we need to know that things are possible, right? Um, we might in fact not believe that change is possible. Um, and so uh, like many people, uh, most well-known historian, perhaps Howard Zinn, right? Like I'm one of those who sort of believes in a usable past, which is to say that um, we can learn from the past, not just to take inspiration, although that I think is important, um, but also even sort of tactics Right, like, um, and the most obvious and the last thing I'll say is that 
you know, America is a more diverse demographic in 2021 than it was, say, in 1913. Right? Um, it was diverse then, it's more diverse now, right? Like if you actually want unionism to succeed, then you have to be anti-sexist, anti-racist, anti-xenophobic, anti-homophobic, because these divisions only weaken, right? Like um, these divisions have no benefits to workers. They only benefit those who want workers to be weaker. Um, and so the IWW wasn't the first union to sort of advocate for these ideas, right? Um, but they were in some ways America's best example of where not just the leaders, but actually the members just sort of were all in with these ideas because who else would join the IWW, right? <laughs> they were hated by the mainstream and brutally repressed, right? Nevertheless, hundreds of thousands joined, right? Like um, that's because they believed in something better, right? Like um, they were visionary and they were willing to take those risks, right? Like. That's what I see, of course, as many of us do in American our time, right? Like there's more energy now in terms of activism, not just in the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, but also before that, but very much since, right? Um, and I'm talking to you from Chicago, right? Like the Chicago Teachers Union is actually sort of one of the best examples of a union that fights not only to improve its own members, but also they went on strike to try to get more librarians, social workers, and nurses for their students, right? Like uh, they went on strike because there's tens of thousands of homeless students in the Chicago public schools. And they were saying, we want to bargain over making sure that our students have housing, right? Like um, those, that's a rare example. That's not the norm, right? Um, but that is actually what we're seeing more of. And for those of us who sort of want a better country and world, these are the sorts of examples that I think we hunger for. Thank you, Peter. Um, try one. So we have a really interesting question, uh, Dr. Cole, from one of the students in my class, Thomas uh, Koch. And he, and it's kind of, I think, pushing back a little bit on your interpretation of Fletcher and Local 8. He's obviously pulling books off the shelf. Abram Harris is the Black worker in which Fletcher reports that rank and file Black workers in Philadelphia were loyal trade unionists. And then this quote from Fletcher, this loyalty was determined by purely practical considerations. Their membership in local aid did not betoken a conversion by the masses to revolutionary syndicalism. So what do you think of that? I think that's a great question and I appreciate that person's knowledge, right? Like, um, so um, though he wrote, Ben Fletcher corresponded with Abram Harris who was this black academic in the 1920s and 30s who wrote, um, co-authored a book called the, the, um, the Black Worker, which is still a classic, right? Like, um, so that book, um, I have four letters between Fletcher, well, from Fletcher to Abram Harris, right? Um, and they're all in the book. So Fletcher is a really interesting figure. Um, in some ways, unattractive, I think, to contemporary Americans when it comes to the, these questions. Fletcher was a believer in the idea that socialism shouldn't necessarily do something special for black workers, right? Um, that socialism, if achieved, would essentially, I won't say solve racism, but nevertheless, it would, um, that uh, the primary fault lines were economic, right? Um, and that, you know, yeah. Um, and so, um, that in a way relates to a question I didn't answer that Andrew asked about sort of Black Panther style sort of like, or Black nationalist unionism. Um, Fletcher very much believed in interracialism, very much, right? He very much would have rejected this notion that you would form a Black caucus within the union, right? Like, um, even though I, I'm not saying that that is illogical to do, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to speak as Ben Fletcher, right? Like. Um, with the knowledge that what I know about Fletcher's thoughts on this is limited, right? Like, um, but Fletcher really believed, and, and so the quote that, um, that, that, that Dr. Gregory read was sort of typical, I think. I think that does fit. Now that was written in, in the late 20s after basically local aid had collapsed. And the only other thing I'd say, or two other things I'd say is one, during World War I, um, there was an influx of black workers into the city of Philadelphia, right? Some of whom ended up on the waterfront. These people were generally right off the farms, right? Um, they had zero experience in cities or factory work, industrial work, right? Um, and they generally were much more loyal to their employer than 
African Americans like Fletcher who were born and raised in the city, right? Like uh, this happens in many cities. And I see Dr. Um, Quintard Taylor was here earlier. Um, so in the Great Migration, there was often a rift between the blacks who were, were in these cities before World War One and the and the new arrivals, right? Um, who were essentially peasants, right? I mean, they had no urban industrial experience, right? These people suddenly are in the IWW, right? Why? Because they got a job on the waterfront and the, the union was willing to take them in, right? They have to be educated, arguably, uh, in order to sort of understand why this union is to their benefit, right? And, and why even this union is so radical, right? Um, they could see that this union was interracial, which is radical, right? Um, but as far as the economics, these people are not necessarily socials, right? Um, uh, and so that actually was one of multiple factors that helped to weaken the IWW, right? Um, because it had this influx of African Americans, Southern Blacks who had no prior experience with wage work for the most part, right? Like, um, and urban life, right? Like, um, and so is Fletcher in that letter maybe thinking about that thousand African Americans who sort of during the war, because the war work was inflated the supply of, of, of jobs, right? Like um, maybe, right? Like um, uh, that's quite possible, right? Like um, was Fletcher sort of, I don't, I don't want to say ignorant, right? Um, but why did Fletcher sort of not believe that racism was such a sort of a huge problem that you need to make extra effort? I can't really say, right? I mean, he suffered from racism, right? Uh, as a black man in early 20th century America, who am I to question him, right? Like, uh, yet at the same time, it's logical to question him, right? Like, cause you can say, well, there are white socialist racists, right? Like uh, um, they, in fact, that's why Australia had a white socialism, <laughs> right? That's why South Africa, there were white socialists who actually were simultaneously claimed to be socialists yet also sort of denied um, the humanity of darker skinned peoples, right? Like, um, so but Fletcher seemed to think that they, that wouldn't require special attention, right? Um, the last thing I'll say about this is that um, among Fletcher's many fans was A. Philip Randolph, um, who in the late teens and early twenties was co-editor of The Messenger. Uh, which published many articles on um, Local 8 and Ben Fletcher, and also was thinking at that time about Garveyism, right? Um, which is really sort of a black separatist organization that sort of precedes the Black Panthers by 40 years, right? Um, and they were worried about Garveyites, right? Um, Philadelphia had thousands, right? Like they didn't want an all black dock worker union, right? They believed that was a mistake. Right, and especially in a country with only 12% black people, right, um, that it would be stupid to try to sort of disregard the fact that 88% of other people in the US were not African descent. Right? Like, um, and so um, why Fletcher thought all these thoughts? I wish I could talk to the man, right? Like, uh, <laughs> and so I'm left with a very imperfect answer, I appreciate, um, but those are some of my thoughts and I very much appreciate that person's question. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, there's a few other, uh, um, you spoke about um, socialism in Australia and there's kind of, there's a couple of questions that came in um, that have to do with um, the IWW internationally. Uh, one question was asking, what was the influence of the IWW in Africa? And the other was asking, what was the IWW's influence just outside of the United States in general? Um, is that a question that you can speak to? Well, I happened to co-edit a book called Wobblies of the World, A Global History of the IWW, um, which is to say I read the chapters that many awesome scholars in other countries wrote, right, um, and sort of helped turn that into a book. Um, so um, I do know I am good friends with the person who has written about the IWW in South Africa. Um, sometime around 1910, a wobbly sailor arrived in Cape Town and an injury to one is an injury to all became a sort of a common motto in Southern Africa. Um, it, the interesting story is that it was a group of dock workers in Cape Town, which was then the biggest port in Southern Africa, um, went on strike after World War I, led by a man from uh, what is now Malawi, but then was a British colony. Um, and um, that union born in Cape Town in 1919 be became known as the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union. And it organized across Southern Africa in what is now Namibia, Zimbabwe, Botswana, and South Africa. Um, and the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union was, their motto was an injury to one is an injury to all. 
This was the largest organization of black men and women for decades. It was much bigger than the African National Congress, right? Like, um, and they adopted the IWW preamble in the mid 1920s, right? So it wasn't IWW, it was a separate organization that basically embraced many of the ideas of the IWW. But as far as the influence of the IWW in Africa, in Southern Africa specifically, it was quite large, right? Like, um, and fascinating to think about for many reasons. Um, there's a lot more to be said about that. Um, but, you know, in other countries, the IWW was very popular. I should say there were many members in Argentina, in Chile, right? Especially in the port city of Valparaiso. Um, you may know actually there was just recently a, a dock strike in Chile, right? Um, that there's a long history of militancy among, and Valparaiso is the big port city, Santiago is not on the coast, right? And so Santiago, uh, Valparaiso is the biggest port on the Pacific coast of South America. You ha have to go up to, San Francisco back in the day for it to, to find a bigger port, right? Like, um, and so, and that some of these wobblies would travel back and forth across the South Pacific, right? And so you have basically wobblies from Australia, New Zealand traveling to South America, right? And spreading this, right? Like South to South, right? Like um, very interesting to sort of think about. Um, and then over around the Cape, you know, in, in Buenos Aires, right? Like, um, and so there were examples um, I should also say that in Philadelphia, one of Fletcher's friends was a man named Manuel Ray, who was a Spanish anarchist and a sailor who made Philadelphia his home in the 19 teens. Um, and uh, there was a lot of Spanish and Portuguese people who worked um, in the shipping industry for sugar. So basically unrefined sugar from Cuba that would go up the coast. And back in the day, every American port city would have had sugar refineries at the port. So they would just unload bulk sugar will be refined there and then distributed within those metropolitan areas, right? Like, um, and so Philly had sugar refineries, right? Every city had sugar refineries, right? Like, and, but a lot of these sailors were Spanish and Portuguese. And there's a long history that also ex goes beyond the, in the US, right? Of sort of anarchistish unions. If you know the history of the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s, there was actually this huge number of people who were very much in the tradition of that, um, the CNT was the acronym for the union that was sort of really a sort of very much a feel similar in thinking to the IWW. So there was actually a bunch of people from I the Iberian Peninsula, right? Um, uh, who were in this milieu in the Atlantic and the Caribbean, right? Um, in the 19 teens and 20, it's a very fascinating subject. And we have a chapter in the book on Spanish anarchist sailors in the Atlantic world, right? Like um, written by actually a man from Galicia, right? Um, so uh, his first language is not Spanish. His second language was Spanish. He does not, his third language is not English. We had to translate that um, chapter, right? Like, uh, but um, it's a fascinating also sort of cross, cross Atlantic, but also really, it was really the Spanish into the Caribbean is the sort of the interesting angle. And there are other scholars who write on Caribbean anarchism as well. Um, uh, but it's, the IWW was part of this orbit, I guess I would say. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, all right, we had um, some other questions about uh, the relationship of Fletcher and the IWW to, um, to other movements. Um, uh, the, one of the earliest questions we had um, that hasn't been addressed yet was what was the influence of labor radicalism unions um, on uh, the civil rights movement? And then another question that's sort of somewhat related, uh, someone asked if uh, Fletcher had any relationship with the um, African-American radical Hubert Harrison. So I was wondering if you could um, speak to those two things, the civil rights movement and uh, Harrison. My pleasure, another great questions. Um, so a lot of people know that in 1960, uh, four black men sat down at a lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina, right? Like what a lot of people don't know is that uh, the first sit down strike was in of IWW members in Schenectady, New York where they struck a General Electric factory in 1906, right? Like, and so 30 years before the more famous sit down strikes of the mid and late 1930s, actually the IWW pioneered the tactic, to my knowledge, that was the first occupation of a factory, right? Like, and then GE was the big corporation in the electricity industry and produced light. I mean, that was GE became, Edison essentially became JE, right? Like, uh, and so um, that's really interesting, very well, very, very poorly known, I should say, right? Like, um, but not direct links, right? And so we wonder, right? So like, okay, so it's easy. A lot of us know that the IWW helped influence some of the people in and some of them were CIO, 
right? Like um, how does that jump then to the 50s and 60s civil rights era? Sometimes we can't make direct links, right? Like, I mean, um, so in terms of the tactics, but we can see that actually these tactics sometimes develops in different places at different times independent, right? Like um, I think music is another sort of obvious parallel. The, the, the Wobblies are sort of legendary for their songs. Um, I didn't talk about it, unfortunately, because you can't talk about everything. Um, but, uh, you know, the Wobblies would create songs. Um, Joe Hill, the most famous Wobbly songwriter would say, you know, you read a pamphlet once, you sing a song, you'll sing it many times, right? Like, um, and so, even when the Wobblies, including Fletcher, sort of pulled into Leavenworth, Kansas, supposedly in late 19, 1918, they um, supposedly came in singing uh, one of their famous songs called Hold the Fort um, for We Are Coming, right? And so they supposedly broke out in a song as they were about to be incarcerated, right? Like um, that sort of singing is another obvious, essentially the labor movement um, in the 30s sort of begets, begets then the civil rights movement, right? And so, um, the fact that We Shall Overcome was, of course, a labor song that was then sort of turned into a civil rights song, right, is sort of another example of that, right? Like, um, and so I think the, the third example is, as again, you might have learned in your class, like the so-called free speech fights that the IWW engaged in, in the late 19 aughts and the early teens, um, basically cities would ban the IWW. Why? Just because they didn't like them, right? Um, and so the Wobblies would sometimes say, well, screw that. We're going to sort of break the laws intentionally, and then we're going to actually not even pay the bail. We're going to fill up your jails. And so in Eastern Washington and the city of Spokane in 1909 was the first famous free speech fight that maybe you talked about in your course, right? Like, um, but rather than, you know, accept this law, they basically said, let's all break the law, right? Um, and we invite more wobblies to come in from other places to sort of break the law with us and hundreds supposedly did and then they filled up the jails and then it cost too much money to sort of basically um, keep all these people in the prison and so they revoked the law right like um and so a the free speech fights which some people consider somewhat diversionary right like this is not about organizing workers why are we doing this right but nevertheless in dozens of cities across the american west and in canada there were free speech fights in the over a decade or so right um that essentially Wobbly is refusing to accept overt political persecution, right? Like um, very similar to people who intentionally break laws that they believe are unjust because they discriminate based on race. Yeah, um, and so there's a number of parallels. I hesitate to say, you know, influences or sort of one did not beget the other necessarily, right? Um, uh, but sometimes that was the case. Um, yeah, so there's that. Um, Hubert Harrison. Hubert Harrison was uh, originally from the Caribbean, but lived in New York City in Harlem for many years, although he died young. Hubert Harrison was a contemporary of Ben Fletcher's. They lived in the same era, right? Um, Hubert Harrison was a socialist, but also uh, active and influential in the Garveyites in the Uni Universal Negro Improvement Association. I have no direct proof that Hubert Harrison and Ben Fletcher knew each other. It seems impossible they did not. But I hesitate always to say what I can't say with certainty, right? Um, but like, they surely must have known each other, right? Like, um, um, Harrison, however, was more of a writer and intellectual, right? Um, he wrote volumes, and so there's actually a lot of his writings that exist, right? Um, and, and, and he thought deeply. Fletcher was an organizer, right? Um, and, you know, the Fletcher actually, his writings are, he's clearly intelligent. He's, he's not very formally educated. Um, Fletcher was not thinking deep thoughts about how to sort of envision socialism, right? Um, he was actually organizing and speaking to try to sort of line up the rank and file, right? Like, uh, and so both are, I think, necessary, right? Um, but what Harrison was really doing, he was a writer and a speaker. Um, and Fletcher was really a sort of a union organizer, but who also did a lot of speaking. Um, so there's a bit of difference. Um, I also have no evidence that Harrison knew Fletcher, even though he wrote a lot, right? Like, uh, and I, I mean, there's a famous, uh, well, the historian Jeff Perry has written extensively about Hubert Harrison, um, including recently. There's nothing in Jeff Perry's thousand pages on Hubert Harrison on Ben Fletcher, which is to say that I assume that there's, that's proof that they didn't know each other, um, unfortunately, right? Like, um, but I put Harrison and Fletcher into the same tier, if you will, of really important black socialists of the early 20th century America. Um, I think they both should be studied and appreciated, um, even if they didn't in fact hang out and play cards. <laughs>
Um, well, we're, we probably have time for maybe one um, more question. Um, and I think maybe I'll hand it over to Jim. Do you, is there anything that you would like to ask that might connect things to your class or, or bring things home for them? Well, I, I think, um, you know, Peter's taken us through a world of information about the law police and anarchists and dock workers and, it, and it's really quite, uh, quite a lot. And there, I think I noticed several people would love you to talk about Fred Hampton and, you know, and this is following up on what you were just talking about, but clearly, you know, they're the Black Panther Party, the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, other episodes of African Americans organizing militantly for not only racial justice, but class justice. Um, how, you know, have, do you have any thoughts on connections there or, yeah. I do, I appreciate that a lot more people know Fred Hampton in no small part because of a powerful movie that was came out recently, right? Um, I also happen to be in Chicago where Hampton's profile has been raised. Um, there's a recent brand new mural that was painted um, to sort of replace one that had faded, but um, you know, the story of the Chicago police murder of, of Hampton is important. So Fred Hampton and Bed Fletcher, right? They're both around 20 when they become radical socialists, right? Committed to sort of revolutionary change. They um, both very intentionally worked with non-Black people. So although the Panthers was largely Black only, as we should know, the Panthers very actively worked with um, other leftists who were of other ethnic and racial groups, right? In the Bay Area, yes. In Seattle, yes. Um, but in Chicago, where I'm talking to you from, the original Rainbow Coalition was the Hampton-led chapter that organized poor whites in a neighborhood one mile from where I'm sitting right now in Uptown. And um, Puerto Ricans and the Young Lords who were two miles from actually <laughs> where I happen to be sitting right now. Um, and so, you know, the Puerto Rican white black right, thing going on in Chicago in 1969, you might say that's why Fred Hampton was killed, right? Like um, uh, in other words, although the Panthers was largely a black organization, they understood that you wanted to work with um, allies who shared your same politics, right? Which was for them revolutionary socialism, right? Like. Um, so too the Wobblies, right? Um, they were uh, sort of were anti-racist and anti-xenophobic in a time when that wasn't the case. Both also suffered massive state repression. Fletcher was um, imprisoned, um, Hampton worse, obviously killed, right? Um, but nevertheless, both cut down, right? Both prominent speakers. So there are similarities, right? Like I don't wanna push it too far, right? Like I do wanna share that thanks to the publication of my most recent uh, book, um, uh, a great nephew of Ben Fletcher found me. Um, he's in his late 60s. He's from Philadelphia also. He was in the Black Panthers in the early 70s. Um, he is still very much what he would call, he calls himself a Black nationalist, right? Um, he's interested in forming Black unions, right? Um, I personally don't sort of agree with that strategy, right? Like, because um, I think that there's a lot of non-Black people who should be in unions too, right? Um, but, you know, he, he's like, the only union I really respect among non-Black unions is the IWW. Of course, his great uncle, he never knew his great uncle. He died, uh, Fletcher died before this guy was born, right? Like, um, uh, and not everyone in the family is pro Ben Fletcher, right? Like, uh, but some are very proud of their family heritage, right? Um, and um, Khalid is one. Um, and so um, we've, I wouldn't say we've had an argument, but I say we have a disagreement, right? Like, uh, because um, he still believes in sort of uh, black unionism, right? Um, which would be more of a sort of a um, nation of Islam black Panther style, right? Like um, I appreciate him and can't disagree with um, his view, right? Um, because that's his sort of experience, right? Like, uh, but I think that there's some similarities, right? Um, small groups of people who are so committed to a cause that they um, force all of us to sort of stand up and look at them and sort of appreciate their sort of commitment um, to uh, sort of a cause and a politics, right? Um, that you can't uh, sort of look away. Both suffered ferocious repression, right? Um, in both cases, basically the, the US federal government made it nearly impossible to be in the IWW or the Black Panthers, right? Um, maybe for different reasons, or actually maybe for the same reason, right? Because they were challenging the status quo in a significant way, right? Um, and were therefore a risk or a threat. Um, so 
yeah, I sort of do that because I try to make these comparisons because I think that they're meaningful, but also because I appreciate that more people are knowledgeable about the Black Panthers than they are of the IWW. Um, and that far more people know of Fred Hampton than Ben Fletcher, right? Um, so I, uh, I apologize if that seems like an imperfect parallel, but- um, no, it's, a, um, it's a great ending because now people are learning about Fletcher. And um, so I just want to thank you very much on behalf of everyone here, an audience of more than a hundred have listened for quite a while. And I think um, learned so much from you. This is really important history. It's also an inspiring story as you've been, been telling us. The book is worth reading. I know you get a lot from listening to, to Dr. Cole, but reading the book and his other books, are, you know, are are absolutely worth it. And uh, Peter, I hope that uh, before too many months have passed, you will join us live in Seattle uh, for more conversations. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us. <laughs>